who will lead your life. The Lord will lead your life. Let us greet one another with a sign of peace on this cool chapel wall. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you.
Hear these words from the psalmist in Psalm 52. Why boast of evil, O my one? God's goodness is all the day long. Disasters your tongue devises like a well-honed razor doing deceit. Your love, you love evil better than good, a lie more than justice. You love all destructive words, the tongue of deceit. God surely will smash you forever, sweep you up and tear you from the tent, root you out from the land of the living, and the righteous will see and be awed and laugh over him. Look, the man who does not make God his stronghold and who trusts in great wealth, who would pretend strength even in disaster. But I, I am like a green olive tree planted in the courtyard of the temple of God. I trust on God's kindness forever. I shall acclaim you forever, for you have taken action, and I have hope in your name, for it is good before you are faithful. Amen. Perhaps in 
would be prompted by the actions of a public figure doing things which shock the conscience. Or perhaps it is something closer to home. Something a slight from someone who I know that hurts me in that small, personal way that can linger in the memory for years. Whether it is public figure or more private nemesis, I can pray this prayer of God's angry condemnation. I can pray this prayer and really mean it. I can pray this like I am sharpening a butcher. You like evil more than good, a lie more than speaking the truth. Disaster, your tongue devises like a well on the razor doing deceit. Why? Of the words themselves, but in the poetry of them, 
that we will find in the deepest and most life-giving waters. It is in the poetry of this song that I think our solution lies. First, understand that the poetry of the songs is nothing like English poetry. Nothing like it. In English poetry, there is rhyme. And rhyme, triple rhyme, slam rhyme, there is meter, iambic, trochaic, doubtful. There is formal structure, stomach, villanelle, liver. That's what makes something a poem. It fits inside of these rules. The language behaves in a certain way, sounds a certain kind of way. Meter, rhyme, formal structure. That's what makes English poetry poetry. It plays on how the language lands on the ear. None of those things are present in the poetry of the Psalms. There is no rhyme, there is no meter, there is no strict number of syllables. The psalm can be eight verses or 150 verses. Each can be different. English poetry is meant to delight the ear. The Hebrew poetry, the poetry of the Psalms, it is meant to delight the mind with an interplay of images and ideas. Each line of song is divided into two halves. If you crack open your Bible and look at the songs, you'll see this. One line will begin all the way on the left, and then the next will begin indented. It has one line broken into two halves. The first half of the line will introduce an idea. The second half intensifies it. Your tongue devises disaster, like a well-known razor doing deceit. Or, the first half will introduce an idea, and the second half suddenly changing. You set a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. This is what makes it a poem. The poetry of the Psalms is structured around the movement of images, the deepening or transformation of ideas. That's what gives it its poetic force. And what's true of an individual line can be true of entire psalms as well. The beginning of a psalm might be totally different in tone and message than the ending. A psalm might begin with a confession of deep failings and end with complete assurance of God's love. Or a song might begin in earnest lamentation over true disaster and end with praise of what good God has done in the world. The beginning and the ending are not meant to be the same. Psalms are structured around the movement and change, the deepening and transformation of ideas. The Hebrew poetry it plays upon the mind. The change of ideas, that's what gives the songs their poetic force. It can happen in a single verse, or it can take place over the entire song. Here, in Psalm 52, we have a classic, classic example of human poetry. It begins with angry condemnation of enemies, each line building beautifully <laughs> upon itself. You love evil more than good, a lie more than speaking the truth. <coughs> God will surely smash you forever, uproot you from the land of the living. And though it begins with angry condemnation, it does not end with damn. Just as it is beginning to run out of space, just as the words are disappearing off the bottom of the page and time is running out, suddenly the song turns. I am a lush olive tree planted in the courtyard of the temple of God. I trust in God's kindness forevermore. I will acclaim you forever, for you have taken action. At the beginning we have the ending of the song. They are not meant to be the same. They are held in tension like poles of magnet. God moves from being the one who uproots to the one who 
who plants firmly in good earth. God moves, the enemy moves from one who is wise and dominates the imagination. And the enemy comes to one who is almost an afterthought, a minor annoyance who could not possibly stand against the faithfulness of God. Poetry of uh, this song. It is a movement from conflict into peace, from fearful anger into assurance, and the hinge around which it all turns is the faithfulness of God. God who does not change. God who is never the same. The Psalms are prayers set to poetry. To poetry. They can be prayed with equal right by anyone. I can pray this song when I am furious with someone who I count as an enemy, and I hope I would pray it. I hope I would pray it, because though it begins by meeting my hunger to decry the wickedness of another, it meets that hunger and it ends by fulfilling a much deeper hunger. To know that I belong to God. <clears throat> that nothing that an enemy can do can change that. That there's nothing that anyone can do to change that. Psalm can be prayed with equal right by anyone. Someone who counts me as an enemy could well pray this psalm and imagine in vivid detail God's judgment coming down upon me, and I hope they would pray it. I hope they would pray it. Because though it begins with destruction, it ends with seeking wholesome growth, honest personal restoration. And honest personal growth, this is something that I want for my enemies, even for my enemies, especially for my enemies. The songs can be prayed with equal right by the even by me. The songs are there for you to take up and pray. There's no requirement before you can pray the psalms, no tests to pass, no hurdles to jump. You don't need to be righteous enough, faithful enough, clever enough, learned enough to pray these things properly. The psalms are ancient prayers waiting for you to breathe life into them again. You just have to pray them and really mean it. That's all. You just have to pray them, and the Psalms will lead you to deep places of peace. Yes, of course, you can be angry at the world, angry at your enemies, angry at your loved ones, angry at yourself, angry enough to wish to die. The Psalms will lead you there, and God will lead you there, and God will lead you you up and plant you in the very courtyard of the temple of God. There to sink your roots deeply down into the rich, dark earth of ancient prayers. God will not uproot you. You have grown into the foundation of the holy place. God could no more uproot you than she could uproot a part of the foundation of the temple itself. God would not destroy you. God could not do so without destroying the heart of yourself. God has not changed. The human heart has not changed. Psalms are prayers. Your prayers. Psalms will meet you wherever you are and will lead you on ancient roads. On paths of peace, to places of deep healing, so that if you walk with them and pray with them, you'll be led on the happy road to destiny.
We are creatures who sometimes grow quickly and sometimes get stuck. God of freedom, of liberation, of the cutting, binding ropes, we are bound in ways we don't always understand or recognize. God of exodus and exile and God of coming home. God who calls us where we are to leave and go out and seek new paths. Help us to have the courage to make the journey and to trust you along the road. God of health and of healing, God who wants us to be made whole. We come as people who are wounded in body and in spirit, people who seek your healing and your peace. We lift up the names of those who are especially on our mind this morning. For Ginny, Alice, Natalie, Tom, Bettina, Russ, Kurt, Barbara, Rodney, Jim, Katya, Marsha, Penny, Jan, Malcolm, Carol, and the family of Marie Friedman. We lift also the names that are on our hearts. God of grace, we come as people who live through that grace. And so we praise you for the growth. We rejoice in being set free. We dance along the path that leads us home. We give thanks for the healing we have received and rest in the knowledge that we are forgiven and freed to live as a people of your grace. And we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Give out a sense of that belonging. 
morning and thanksgiving. This morning's offering will now be given to and received. Amen. Oh. 